everyone is so special and unique and brings such an interesting vantage point or skill set to the team. And I think that's so important for a small office. Business of Architecture, episode 361. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking to one of the co-founders of Charlap, Hyman and Herrero, uh, Andre Herrero. Andre received his architectural training at the Rhode Island School of Design, graduating with a degree in fine arts and a degree in architecture in 2012. Then he went to the UK and visited us in London, working for David Chipperfall Architects and then working for Sana in Tokyo and So Ill in New York before co-founding his practice with Adam Charlotte Hyman in 2015. As a principal of Charlotte Hyman and Herrero, Andre leads a multidisciplinary practice based both in Los Angeles and New York, and they work in various typologies, including buildings, products, set designs, stores, and interiors, and his firm aims to create spaces that become worlds in and of themselves. In 2018, Andre was ranked among Forbes magazine's 30 under 30 in their art and style category. And in 2020, their firm won the AIA LA Emerging Practice Award. In this conversation, Andre and I discuss how they have grown their practice, how they have gone into new sectors and opened up new product lines, and how they are running a bi-coastal firm. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Andre Herrero. Fantastic. Andre, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very excited to be speaking with you. Now, you're one of the founding partners of Charlotte Hyman and Herrero. Uh, You guys are based out in wonderful, in LA, in California. Um, So we're doing a kind of across the pond dialogue here, um, which will be really interesting for a lot of our listeners in the UK to understand how, how you've been growing your business. Um, and so, yeah, I suppose the, the first question to sort of jump in to it was, is, can you give us a little bit of background about how you started, how you started the business? Sure. Yeah. So I started this architecture and design practice in 2000. 15 with uh, my now business partner Adam and we started the practice in New York Um, and it just started you know extremely organically I don't think that we were trying to start a practice Mm. we just kind of started by by chance by taking on one project and then another project and then another project and the full backstory of that is actually you know, Adam was a interior designer working on a project, um, which was a home on the Upper West Side in New York. Um, and I was uh, working for another architecture firm at the time. And I was the project architect on that same project. Right. And so although Adam and I both went to school together, we, we weren't, you know, planning on starting a practice or, or working together in any, in, by any means. But I think, you know, we just worked together on this one project and it went so well and we got, we, you know, we already had a friendship and we already had kind of this mutual admiration for each other, but Mm -hmm. kind of solidified this like, wow, and now we can work together quite nicely. Um, And, uh, and that's kind of our first working together without having a business together. And then, um, the practice kind of our our first kind of independent projects happened by um by chance where uh you know there were some there were some projects that came into my architecture office that were essentially too small for the architecture office to take on um and they gave it to adam um and you know adam basically Adam and I started working on these like after hours projects, these very small little gallery renovations and, you know, um, 
like a facade recladding or something, you know, very small things with really, really low budgets where we had to be very creative and kind of scrappy. Um, a lot of times we, you know, we would build it ourselves even, um, or with some friends. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, these little projects were happening and word was getting out that, you know, we could design galleries and we weren't, um, as pricey as maybe some of the other more established gallery architect firms mm. in New York. Um, and we both kind of had this kind of art school background. Um, so we got the art scene and we got the gallery scene. Um, and, uh, yeah, one gallery after another, we, we kind of built up a little bit of a reputation and then decided we should probably come up for a na- come up with a name for ourselves <laughs> and for this firm that was kind of starting whether we planned for it or not so so were you guys you were moonlighting essentially for a little while was there any kind of conflict of interest between your the, the companies that you were gainfully employed at and whilst you were doing you were setting up I guess I can't really speak for him, but in, in terms of the architecture firm that I was at, mm-hmm. I, it was very, I wasn't moonlighting for very long. It yeah. was kind of the last couple months. Um, and um, I was already kind of wanting to make a change from uh, New York to Los Angeles. So mm-hmm. I was kind of leaving behind my old architecture firm and, you know, subsequently starting this new one, but I didn't realize, um, it was actually going to turn into a thing. It was just kind of some projects to hold me over while I figured out my transition to moving back to the West coast. Right. So you're originally from the West coast. I'm originally from Seattle, Washington. Yeah. Okay. And you spent a little bit of time in the UK as well prior. Yeah. I was, uh, I was at uh, David Chipperfield for a minute. Um, when I was, um, yeah, probably like 10, 10 years ago. Fantastic. That's quite a, a quite a prestigious practice to gain a bit of experience in. Um, yeah. How did you enjoy working in London? Lon- London, I mean, it's fantastic. It's not so dissimilar than Seattle in terms of climate. So yeah. that, that didn't bother me um, so much. And then just, I think, you know, Chipperfield is a very buttoned up office and it was um, such a good experience to, to see kind of how they operated. Mm. Um, my pri- my prior experience to that was, a, a quite a long half year internship at Sana in Tokyo. And that's a, just those two wow. offices and the organization <laughs> of those two offices were, um, so different and and I just I learned a lot from both and I just kind of grabbed grabbed the qualities from each office that I liked um mm. and and kind of try to instill those into this office and and when you made the transition back to the west coast back to California how did you then start because obviously you've, you've just started to build up a network of of contacts and consultants and potential clients in New York was the idea then just to go fully into you know being an LA business or you were going to become you know you aspired to be bi-coastal how did it how did you how are you going to sort of yeah. drum, up, drum up new work when you've just you've just kind of set foot into an already very difficult city and now moving to another very difficult city to kind of crack right yeah it was I mean, I think for me, I just felt so strongly that I had to be in a location where I wanted, where I wanted to live and wanted to grow, like grow old. And, and for me, I I wanted to be back on the West coast and LA seemed like I I had kind of this rose colored romantic vision of myself in Los Angeles. And it just felt, I just felt so strongly that I wanted to live here and be here. And I didn't really think about anything else other than like I will be happy there and then from this point on like everything else will fall into place and so Uh, was and so did Adam was Adam going to stay there or was he going to come over how did it how did it work I mean 
the way I think and, and feel about Los Angeles is probably similar to how he thinks and feels about New York. I feel like it's just in his blood and he just loves being there and loves being a New Yorker. Um, and, and, and he just like is so New York. And I feel like by contrast, I'm so Los Angeles, um, whatever that might mean. (laughs) I mean, for some, maybe it means something totally different than others, but. And, and so how did you continue to collaborate then if, if, and then how has the business started to, uh, evolve both in terms of typology and in terms of structure? In typology, yeah. I mean like the kind of the projects that you're working on. Totally, yeah. So I think, you know, we started off in New York, kind of small scale galleries. Mm. Um, and so we, we had like a little bit of a toe in, the, in, a, in a cultural art type world. And a lot of our um, alumni network um, from our school is they're all artists. So we we definitely play within this artist network. Mm. Um, a lot of the kids who graduated from our college are still on the East Coast. Right. Um, so this was um, like the Ro- Rhode Island Design School? Rhode Island School of Design, yeah. yeah. Um, so they're all, um, most, most, most alumni are still on the East Coast. Um, so I think in New York, it was, it was galleries. And then because Adam is, uh, is an interior designer or furniture designer, it's, mm-hmm. it's stayed, it's, it's more interior design, um, practice in New York, um, which makes a lot of sense yes. as New York is pretty much a city of, of interior design um the actual built up architecture is you know a lot of it's already a lot of the land is already spoken for yep uh, and uh yeah so i think you know he's running the new york office and it's a lot of interiors projects and that's another one of these that's another reason why i just felt like los angeles was such an exciting place for me to be because I just felt like it was the wild wild west of architecture I mean I Mm. I just felt like it was a lot of space a lot of um you know the the fabric is so spread out the urban fabric so spread out and a lot of the building stock is not so precious that exists and a lot of it's just LA has kind of this architectural history of I mean they have the of course, the case study houses, but they also have this architectural history of just kind of a little bit of a reverence, I think. Mm. And they just, whatever, whatever people want to do, they do. Uh, if they want their uh, Greek villa, they'll build their Greek villa. It's, you know, it's almost like this Hollywood set design. I want this lifestyle. I'm going to get it type attitude, um, which was also kind of really funny and exciting. To it's, me. It, it's wonderful. I remember when I visited LA a few years back and I went and saw some of the John Lautner buildings, um, oh, homes amazing. and, um, was like, you know, you could see the, the, you know, this the beautiful Lautner house and then you could perhaps see in the distance, was it Richard Nitra? And then, then, then you can see all these kinds of like faux French mansions and then yeah. an, an Italiante styled villa over there. And then like a kind of Spanish styled house. And it was all just sort of, it peppered, yeah. peppered along the hills and it, it, it does it, it adds it contributes to a very um a dynamic and kind of liberated totally. culture in a way and and it's also i think like it's still a blank canvas for the definition of what is like the los angeles style and and there's just so much it just feels like a land of potential in terms of architecture and mm. um, and so we're really excited on some of our ground up projects that we have going on here to sort of think about what a Los Angeles architecture is and just kind of really experiment. Um, Mm. because we don't, we don't really have any sort of traditional or, you know, historical or existing architecture that you have to play off of or have some sort of dialogue with. It's just, (laughs) you know, it's, it's like a history of chaos. Um, (laughs) which is very different than London, for example. Um, and, and, you know, I was working on the, the massive horizontal skyscraper by Waterloo Station, Elizabeth Tower or something. Right, okay, yeah. 
Um, and that was, you know, it's all about context. It's all about what the building looks like from all the various other um, historic vantage points within the city of London. Yeah, the uh, viewing corridors and things being yeah, protected yeah, and exactly, how, how you're, exactly. sort of, you're, you're gently molding it into the skyline so it's inoffensive. And... Totally. Yeah, none of that's happening right here. <laughs> There's no, no viewing corridor in Los Angeles. <laughs> Brilliant. So, so tell me a little bit about how, how do you and Adam work then now? Um, is, yeah. he, is, 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 is it two very separate locations and, and separate studios or how do you, how do you continue to grow together? Uh, good question. It's the question everyone, everyone loves to ask because it is, it is, I, there's not many precedents of a firm kind of starting off on two coasts and slowly two coasts. Um, and it just have just has to do with I think Adam and I work are both basically very hard workers. And so we yeah. both constantly work. There's no sort of uh are you even doing anything type attitudes. <laughs> um, it's just like we're both we both work very hard. Yeah. And also we're we kind of are in charge of uh, different departments, so to speak. So, you know, he's very much in charge of the interiors department. Mm. You think about that. And I'm very much in charge of the architecture department. And also he's in charge of like, um, New York and I'm in charge of Los Angeles. Mm. And so all if, and, and there's like some sort of overlap that happens, of course, for example, you know, we have interiors projects in Los Angeles and we have some architecture projects in New York and, for those, the, the, you know, those projects are still managed by like the interiors project is still managed by Adam and the architecture project is still managed by me, but, um, essentially we can kind of sub out to each other, like tasks that need to get it done locally. Oh, got it. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you might be working on an interiors project in, in LA, but, and he's doing the design work and the kind of the spec work as such based in new york but if you need to go on site or something needs to be happening on site you're able to go totally yeah it's a, you can almost think about it as summing out various tasks and then on the in terms of the uh, and that's the logistical side of things in terms of the creative side mm. of things um everything happens creatively collaboratively between the two offices so kind of the initial start of a project whether it's los angeles new york uh interiors or architecture we, we go through, you know, various iterations and studies and a critique process between the two offices. So creatively, we kind of are both in the mix and kind of everyone, everyone in the office, not uh, just us, has a very valuable, like brings a, something very unique and valuable in their <coughs> critique. Yeah. And it really um, kind of gives a lot of depth to the work and that, I think is uh, that that happens between both offices at the beginning. And then it's sort of the management aspect um, will be taken on by one office or another. Right. And, and, on. and, and so just practically, how do you, I suppose, obviously now that, you know, right now it's COVID and your mode of communication hasn't really changed then. Yeah, it, it, it has not now. Um, you know, we don't, I think, I guess we probably talk to each other every day, but in some mm. form or another, whether it's a text, a call, a Zoom, a Google Hangout. Um, and it's just, I think we're both, we've been doing this for five years now that we're both, we can kind of finish each other's cyber sentences, whether it's like, <laughs> you know, a text or a sketch or a, you know, it doesn't need to be so explained Yeah. Um, between us. Like when we're talking to each other, it's just, you know, like this or like this, or we'll reference other things that we've done before. It's very shorthand digital type communication. Yeah. Um, so between us, it's very efficient. I think it's when we're dealing with a, con a consultant that's on the other coast, that's when you need, you know, have like extremely clear diagrams and drawings and be able to like share a screen and rotate the thing and point at the thing and say, just like this, yeah. or like build a model and ship the model. And, um, but, but between us internally, it's just so shorthand that we get it. Got it. Uh, 
And 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 so how how are you, are you both then involved and in charge of your own client acquisition on on both sides of the coast, or? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we both we both bring in the work for sure, and it's uh, it's just so it's so if it's so different. I think sometimes like where we get some work and I think it's it's really important to have that sort of variety of where you're getting work because ultimately it it, it kind of expands your network a bit more yeah um, and yeah so, so we've gotten some you know our start in LA happened because I met um, our first client here at the gym and you know from that one project we've gotten a couple various other kind of meeting people talking to people networking mm. um we've built a, a good sort of client base in los angeles and then you know now we're realizing that you know our clients in los angeles might also have an apartment in new york and people with an apartment in new york might be looking to build uh you know a ground up and um you know, Santa Barbara or something. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's, a, there's a real, there's a real, we're, we're learning about the advantage of this thing, which started off as kind of scary and, you know, how, how are we going to do this? But now it's like, wow, all the dots are starting to connect between the two coasts. Mm. Um, and we can see how it's like, you know, the clients that we make that we, um, that we win in New York or, or Los Angeles might also be doing stuff on the opposite. And, and it just kind of expands the whole network. Mm. And so, yes, we both bring in clients from, from the two coasts. And sometimes, you know, you know, I brought in a client that we're building a house in Virginia and he's brought in some clients in Los Angeles that are doing interiors that are thinking about doing architecture. So it all just kind of overlaps. Um, Have you had any, um, say complications then with say doubling up of systems or doubling up of resources or how do you how do you kind of um pull the resources or the processes that you're developing so that you're not doing the same thing twice or does it not matter uh we're we're really we're really cognizant try to be very efficient we it by having an interiors and architecture all under one roof yeah. so to speak um we actually save clients uh, money in that there's like the coordination between those two fields is just, is just so streamlined. Mm. Um, and in terms of doubling up, I mean, I'm trying to think of what exactly you might mean in terms of like, let's say you have like a, you know, a typical renovation has a task list, you know, first we need to get our surveys and then we need to get our um, consultants in a row and all these sort of task lists. But, you know, it, it all falls under usually just one person to get all that done. Yeah. Um, and, you know, someone from his office isn't doing the exact same thing that someone from my office is doing. Yeah. I, sp I suppose it's, yeah, in, in terms of like other other resources or you know someone like an office manager for example um, oh, do, do, you, do you end up having two office managers one for each location or or are there roles which are kind of dual location or or, or is everybody's role sort of dual location gotcha yeah so those sort of um project those sort of kind of uh support not architects not designers that support happens, uh, yeah, it happens double. So, right. And it also has to do with the industry standards. So got it. You know, interior design, you're focused a lot more on, uh, it's a very big logistics game. Mm. Um, and it's a lot of tracking of receipts and uh, vendors and timing and shipping. And it's, it's a huge logistics. It's much more of a logistics game than architecture is, believe it or not. Mm. Um, and, and they have a, a completely different time tracking system. They have a different, 
um, sort of product inventory tracking. They have, um, you know, their accountant spe- spe- or bookkeeper specifically deals in that. So it effectively it runs like two separate businesses because the businesses are so different. Right. Right. Uh, it, it, it's and it's because of the scale of our office too. If we were a much larger office, maybe those could go under one roof. Right. But for now, it just is so much more efficient to have the back end of one industry and the back end of another industry just be completely separate. And we even um, bill separately, you know, right. be so that the money is going into the right accounts. And it's all just really cleanly and organized and tracked so so in terms of like a business structure the way that it's set up are they are they two independent llc's or is it one ll one company and yeah, you, so and you have, LA, you have two accounts yeah totally so we it, it's it's two separate ones right now it's just the easiest thing to do as i said for the scale of office that we are yeah uh, in uh in los angeles we are a, a professional corporation and in New York, we are an LLC. Right. Okay. An architect. Uh, yeah. So architecture firms in, in California cannot be LLCs. Ah. Uh. And so that's why we're that. So there's also um, there's also a liability aspect to separating them out. Um, the New York office also carries an insurance that is specific to interior designers, and we carry pro- you know professional practice insurance. Got it. Uh, and we take on, and we also contract differently depending on the scope of work. Yeah. So if the scope is uh, architecture, we'll contract with it, even if it's in New York. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a very, very clean, yeah, as you say, it's a clean and quite efficient structure. Yeah, for the scale of the practice right now, for sure. Um, it just, it, it's very, very clear. It, it, the back of house is very clear. The front of house, we like to, in terms of the marketing and the, and, and the client experience, we want to yeah. make it as singular and as seamless as possible. But the back of house, we keep it completely separate so that we the data is, is, is very organized. Yeah. Love it. Um, so is there potential then for you to expand or is that a desire into other, you know, providing other sort of turnkey services? So maybe there's a, there's a, you know, a, a retail aspect to this, or there's a, a fit out aspect, like in terms of, you know, the design and build the contracting. Totally. Yeah, no, we're, we're always looking for opportunities to kind of expand and streamline the architecture process and mm. interior process. Um, there's, I think, you know, we're really excited about the idea of potentially doing some for it. And it, and it really depends on the scale of work that you're working in. You know, so mm. some, some of these projects, when you're a smaller company, it makes a lot of sense to do design build, for example. Yeah. Uh, uh, otherwise, your design fees just get too expensive for what the product is. Mm. Uh, and whereas if you're a design build, you may not need to draw such extensive construction documents so that you can bid the project out with, you know, minimal change orders or, you know, contingencies. Yeah. Um, and, and we also really enjoy that sort of hands-on construction process as well. So we're, we're definitely thinking about maybe expanding into construction a little bit we also really like um you know as a young practice sometimes you have to make your make your own clients so we like the we like the idea of really kind of you know we've been working on kind of sourcing out plots of land and, and typologies and kind of bringing projects to certain clients that we think might won't be excited to do something we kind of lay it all out for them um, so we're kind of creating pro- our own projects as well. Brilliant. Um, so de- development is definitely something that we're diving into a little bit as well. And then, of course, we have, um, you know, the kind of, we, we, we've collaborated with various um, companies on, on certain products. 
whether it be uh, fabrics, wallpapers, um, you know, we have, um, you know, some lighting. Um, and so that, that is also kind of a fun aspect that, that we're diving into a little bit as well. Yeah. So we're, we kind of always have our eyes open and we're always, we're very flexible right now and we're, we're still experimenting. We're still trying to figure out, you know, what our practice is and, and maybe it'll always be this sort of think tank experimental practice. Um, and that's so fun and exciting. Uh, can we talk a little bit more about the, the products actually? Cause that's a really interesting venture that many architects perhaps, perhaps maybe more a better well-trodden in the interior world. Um, but very interesting for, you know, for architects to be involved in, in products. How does that work in terms of the, the business? So the products, uh, the products have come about pretty organically. Um, it's usually has to do with, so we're working on a project, so we design it and, um, and then it's, it's a little bit, we, we started thinking, why don't, this is such a cool thing. We should sell it. So now we're working on, you know, if we design something custom for a client, um, you know, why not create a version of it that could potentially be sold to other people, whether or not they engage our services. Mm. So, and, and, and the other nice thing about it is it starts to kind of create, as you were saying earlier, it starts to create uh, a little bit of a world yes. or a little bit of a, um, yeah, a little bit of a world that you can really kind of get that kind of brings more depth maybe to the architecture and interiors. And, and how are those, uh, are those all as collaborations or are they kind of totally done in house? Uh, some of them are in house and some of them are collaborations Our our wallpaper and fabrics are all collaborations with, um, larger companies that do collaborations with other interior designers. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we did a, a line of lighting um, with a collaborator, um, but it wasn't a, a manufacturing collaborator, but we just designed, collaborated with Green River Project LLC, um, their furniture company in New York. And right now we're working on basically if there's some downtime or we'll, we'll kind of start to, we're starting to create kind of a, a lot like an index of other products that will be hitting the website soon mm. and and whether or not they sell i i don't know it's not it's not a big part of our our business right now but i think it's one of those things that you know we'll see we're gonna build it and we're gonna put things out there and mm. and we'll see um well it, it's an interesting uh model because though like products have an ability to become quite visible you're able to distribute them not even in terms of the physicality of them but in terms of imagery you know they're mm -hmm. kind of quite quick they're often they've got a lot shorter production cycle than a building or even an, an interior space in, really? in 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 some cases anyway and uh, you know what's interesting for us actually in terms of press yeah is you know, you know magazines will have top 10 things to buy for et cetera, et cetera. And we can start to gain additional outlets of press. And then another interesting thing about the products is other architects and designers will use them. So now we're in other projects that, that we didn't necessarily design. And some of them are really special and really fun projects that we ha are now a part of without having actually been hired. So it's, it's really interesting. And that contributes to even more press. I love that. I, I've often heard when I've spoken to practices that some of the smaller projects that they get involved in, or sometimes they're, sometimes they're just kind of fun passion projects that those mm -hmm. end up becoming very useful kind of marketing allies or collateral in terms of, yeah, they're easy to get into magazines. Other people are talking about them. Other people want to use them. Um, there's, okay. a, there's, there's an element, you know, particularly with objects and products that there's a less, there's less commitment involved in, in terms of the consumer. Oh, um, it's a marketing expense. Yeah. 
And we have lots of projects that are essentially marketing <laughs> expenses as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, smaller scale projects that are, you know, maybe that we know we'll get, we'll be able to get good press. Um, we'll take on for a loss. Um, so how have you been building the, the team and the culture uh, of the practice? And it's, it's very clear as soon as you go onto the website that there's a very distinct visual look and presence and feel to the business. How are you, how are you kind of cultivating uh, the team and the culture behind the scenes? Very slowly. Um, it's been a very slow process where we, um, but everyone that is on our team on the New York office and the LA office, everyone is so special and unique and brings such an interesting vantage point or skill set to the team. And I think that's so important for a small office. Um, and I think it's, I mean, I think it's just, uh, I think it really is. I think we were talking about this earlier. It really is just a um, kind of a a vibe. <laughs> I mean, we, we just trust our we trust our instincts. We interview a lot, and even if we're not hiring, we'll be interviewing right. because I think um, I think it's just so important to you know to keep your finger on the pulse and and know who's out there and what people are doing. And you know, we're genuinely interested in all the people that we interview and the work that they're doing mm. and you know we like talking with them and understanding their you know, how they think about architecture or interiors and and you know we're always looking for someone to join our team even when we're not mm. a place to hire um and we have kind of like in the back of our minds we have like oh man she would be amazing <laughs> if she was a part of our team um, so yeah, I think it's really kind of a, an ongoing process and a forever process. Mm. And, and so by doing that, how are you kind of, um, in communication with potential new members of staff? Do you, are you constantly advertising for positions or is it part of the kind of networking culture that you have as an office where you're, you know, you invite people in for discussions? It's a little bit of both. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a little bit of both. We, we, I mean, we also do the, the typical, we'll, we'll critique, we'll do podcasts. We'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll be around and we we'll, we're always looking at other people's work and asking other people how they're doing or what they're doing. Or I don't know. There's just like, I have so much interest in where the industry is going and what people are doing in it. Mm. that it, it just kind of happens organically. Fantastic. So what's, what's the rest of 2020 got planned for you guys? It's been a pretty, oh well, gosh, I don't know. You were just talking about an asteroid. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, assu assuming that we survive the asteroid, <laughs> assuming that we survive the asteroid, um, we, I mean, we just signed, three new projects yesterday. Mm. So yesterday was a good day. Um, and there, one is kind of a fun, uh, ground up, uh, office project that is actually, you know, a few streets away from our office in Los Angeles. And I think they found us by just Googling architect. So that's a huge win. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and then another, or, uh, two pretty special renovations, um, in, uh, in Los Angeles. So I think, you know, for now it's still a lot of private projects. We're, we're also doing a big, um, speaking of, uh, press projects, we have a, a big, um, Vitra sort of, um, interiors project that we've been working on for the last six months, probably that's going to be opening up here in the next month um mm. and that we did a we did an entire environment inside of one of the herzog and dimeron um you know house boxes i don't um and we and we made oh, a fantastic a we made a bunch of uh products for that and also used a bunch of vitro products and also 
um, uh, used a lot of uh, products that were designed by a lot of our friends and collaborators. Mm. So we kind of created a, a world, a very, very much a CHH world in one of those Vitra um, boxes, which would be re- really fun. Um, so that's the only, that's the only cultural project that we we have a lot of cultural projects that are on pause and hopefully they uh, kick back up again and then a bunch of retail projects that are on pause that hopefully kick back up again but in the immediate future it's a lot of um it's a lot of private residencies right right and so you if you've found covid has kind of impacted certain sectors for sure yeah the the public sectors <laughs> So any, any, you know, we had two opera sets that we, that we had designed that are now paused. Um, and then we had about three or four retail shops that were in the design development phase that they just paused. Um, so hopefully those pick back up. And in the meantime, we're so grateful that we've kind of have this diverse portfolio of work. Um, because when one sector goes, usually there's another sector that's still doing all right, or in some cases, even thriving, you know, as people are sitting at home and wanting to create a more, you know, I want a more separate office environment, or I, you know, can't stand how loud my kids are when I'm trying to work and we need to figure this out. So a lot of new sort of residential challenges that clients are asking of us right now which are pretty fun that, that's very interesting and i've certainly heard the same in, in the uk like a lot of there is a lot of opportunities that have arisen from people you know we're kind of having this uh, quite profound re-evaluation of how we use our domestic space and how to make it suitable and even the even the structure of the city is kind of being questioned you know are are people going to go back into the centers of cities and use them like they once they once were we have a client who you know he works for a huge internet startup and that internet startup has basically decided that they are no longer going to have offices just flat out this is the way that they're going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that's a, it's a big company. It's, it's, I'm, I can't name names, but it's like, I don't know. It's a big company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Most people would know it. Um, but that's, I mean, that just seems, I mean, maybe that'll change, but it seems like such an intense stance i mean the, like mm. what does that mean for architecture what does that mean for living what does that mean for commercial real estate mm. um very interesting the the future sort of butterfly effect of this whole thing yeah well it you know we were already going through this kind of reevaluation of our physical space with you know our kind of virtual life that we lead and you know you can kind of see it in a, in a teenager's a, you know teenager in the 80s and 90s their their place for self-expression was the bedroom now it's a tiktok page or a or a you know a facebook page or whatever right it's, yeah instagram pages um there's and there's that kind of shift of being, you know, their environment now is what is the most appropriate background for their TikTok. Or, <laughs> you know, you know, I was reading this really interesting article on um, TikTokers looking for. I think it was in the New York Times. TikTokers looking for um, apartments to rent in Los Angeles, um, and you know, their criteria is is just so specific they are looking they go straight to the bathroom how big is the bathroom mirror what is the lighting in the bathroom and they all kind of have this sort of home depot which is our hardware store aesthetic of like and and it's just something relatable not too not too not too distracting for a background not too interesting just kind of like you know like the perfect sort of washed over background that allows people to, I don't know, take it, like 
think of it as reality. Wow. That's good lighting. It's, 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 it's really interesting. So, I mean, it, it's like another level of, you know, in the, in the film industry, you've got location scouts and there are sort of properties that are on lists for, for films. It's kind of yeah. another, another level of that where it's a much more consumer market where lots of people are trying to figure out what's going to be the best background for certain meetings or for certain bits of content that's being produced. And for, yeah, it's t- so interesting. And I can't wait to design a, a TikTok house. <laughs> There's all these, there's all these, there's all these houses here that are rented mm. by TikTok um, or YouTube, and put in a bunch of you know famous TikTokers or YouTubers all in this one house, and they create content in this house, and the they're hype, usually just the sort house. of these like whatever, whatever make mansion, yeah, make mansions or in the hills. But I would love to do one from the ground up. Maybe I think that's our the third goal right now. <laughs> love it. I love it. Are you, are you on TikTok? Do you have a TikTok account? Uh, I do. I, I haven't posted anything on it. I actually am not on it that frequently. But we've been thinking about a company TikTok for sure. <laughs> Brilliant. I, I love it. It's, it's become my, over, over the last sort of five, six months, I've become obsessed with it. And it's, 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 it's addictive for sure. It's so different from all the other sort of social media platforms. And it's a very direct way of communicating with people. And it can be the culture of it as well is quite, is quite fun yeah. and amusing. Totally. And there should be a business of architecture TikTok if there isn't. Well, I, well, I actually, I have, I've, I've set one up. I set a business for architecture. It's not doing that well. My personal one is doing very well, but I haven't, I haven't put too much effort into the business for architecture one in yet. I'll have Gotta to get on that. Gotta get on that. Brilliant. Andre, thank you so much uh, for, your, for your time. Thank you. And your, your expertise. Really fun. Really enjoyed this conversation. Cool. Likewise. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.